Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to the closing event of the Kasoli Art Center exhibition that is on display at the Museum of Fine Arts in Punjab University. The exhibition was inaugurated on 16th October by Professor Renu Wig, Honorable Vice Chancellor Punjab University, in the presence of the guest of honor, Dr. B. N. Goswami, whose was the vision in associating Punjab University with the Kasoli Art Workshop, in the process, adding the finest modern Indian artists' works in the collection of the museum. Unfortunately, we lost this doyen of art on 17th November, a month into the exhibition, turning the exhibition into a tribute to Dr. Goswami and Vivan Sundaram, both greats of art history and art in India. This exhibition, while being a tribute to them, is also our own humble endeavor to carry forward their great legacy. The exhibition, which closes tomorrow, that is on the 4th of December, is a must-see, and I urge all those who have not been there yet to kindly take time out and come and see it. I can assure it will be worth your while. Today, we are privileged to have with us Miss Neelima Sheikh, one of doyens of Indian art, who through her art has brought forth a nuanced rendering of the past and present, mythology and modern history, feminist concerns, and issues of violence, migration, and loss. Born to doctor parents in 1945, Neelima Sheikh's early interest in art was sparked by Kamal and Divyani Krishna, who taught at her school. This propitious beginning led to her admission at MS University's Faculty of Fine Arts after having studied history in Delhi. While studying painting at Baroda, she was influenced by K.G. Subramaniam and Gulam Muhammad Sheikh. Dilima Sheikh's art practice draws upon craft and folk art traditions, miniature and manuscript paintings, Persian and Central Asian art, pre-Renaissance European paintings, tempera paintings, she has also collaborated with traditional paper stencil artists from Mathura for over two decades. Her work has a figurative narrative structure with text being incorporated into it, uh, into it as well, enriching the visual with illusions of the textual and song. She has worked with tempera on handmade paper, on canvas and board, and a scale has gone from the small, reminiscent of miniature painting to vertical scrolls theater sets, screens, and the Shamiana. Nilima Sheikh has written on art in books and journals and catalog essays, and also illustrated books for children. She has lectured on art in India and internationally. Earlier this year, she was selected as the Mittal Institute's inaugural Distinguished Artist Fellow at Harvard University. She started exhibiting in 1969 and has done so prolifically in India and around the world. Some of her solo exhibitions include Lines of Flight, Nilima Sheikh Archive at the Asian Art Archive, Hong Kong in 2018, Terrain, Carrying Across, Leaving Behind at Kemald Prescott Road, Mumbai in 2017, and Gallery of Space at Bikaner House, New Delhi in 2018. Each night, put Kashmir in your dreams at the Art Institute uh, of Chicago in 2014, as well as in India, at the Lalit Kala Academy and in Bombay. The country without a post office, reading Aga Shahid Ali, again at Gallery Kemald in 2003, to name just a few. Some of her recent group participations include Thinking Historically in the Present at the Sharjah Ben Ali, a 15, in 2023, Kemolding, Framing Future Archives at Gallery Kemald, Prescott Road's 60th anniversary exhibition in 2023, Woman is as woman does at the CSMVS Mumbai in 2022. Uh, miniature 2.0, miniature in contemporary art at Istanbul in 2020, and the seismic movements at the Dhaka Art Summit in 2020 and at Kochi in 2018. Now I invite on stage our artist of the evening, Ms. Nilima Sheikh, and to take forward the conversation with her I also invite Ms. Latika Gupta. Over to Latika Gupta. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Um, thank you so much, Professor Greval, for a, a very rich introduction. Um, and many of the things that uh, Professor Greval spoke about um, are going to be discussed today. Uh, Neelima Sheikh is going to be taking us through her work um, across the decades, jumping back and forth between chronology. Um, but the occasion for this talk is really the Kasoli Art Center um, that was set up in 1976 by the artist Bivan Sundaram at his family home, Ivy Lodge in Kasoli. Um, that was bequeathed to him and his sister Naveena Sundaram by their mother, Indira Shirkir. Nilima had been a part of the workshops till they came to a conclusion in 1991. And um, at the beginning, we are going to be speaking about that as well. Um, the exhibition uh, is open till the end of day tomorrow for those of you who haven't seen it. So uh, it will be lovely if you do. Um, to begin, Nilima will speak and then we'll have a conversation um, about her work with images. I'm in Chandigarh after many years. I regret having been away for so long from the karma bhumi of Professor Pien Goswami. My ardent salutations to his memory. Now I think we go on to the Kaswali Art Center and I'll talk about uh, the exhibition a little bit as we talk, which I've only seen today. There is a lot of pleasurable nostalgia that I have to shift when I try to talk about Kasoli Art Center, or just Kasoli as it came to be known amongst us friends. There they were for me three pleasurable occasions when I stayed and worked with other people, friends who became friends, friends and those who became friends, visual artists, creative people from other fields. Every summer, Ivy Lodge, Vivan's home, would brim over with all kinds of creative practitioners. This is all too clearly and beautifully put across in this exhibition that is on at the museum, which will you, so I'm just, actually this is just a notation for those who haven't been there. First of all, before we talk about what happened at the Kasoli Art Center, we need to understand that this was entirely the initiative of one person artist, activist, Vivan Sundaram. It was his idea, his determination to turn his inherited home in the mountains into a hub of activity and energy. His careful planning to bring across sections of practitioners from inside and outside the country into this hub. His energetic organiza organizational drive to make, to pull apart, and to remake infrastructure. Of course, there were partners in the project, those who were inspired by his ever expanding vision of a space where interconnected creativities could emerge in this beautiful mountain environment. It would flow, erupt, be hammered out in an idyllic home and its multifunctional outhouses and open spaces. At the edge of the mountain where the lights of Chandigarh could be seen sparkling when the sky went dark. Vivan's vision could be realized only with the pioneering support of the Fine Art Museum of the Punjab University at Chandigarh which then became not only the financial support of this enterprise, but over the years has become the repository of art made at the Kasoli Art Center, which can be seen in, in the comprehensive exhibition. The exhibition details the interactive public nature of the annual events, as well as allows artists to be privy to the in-house discussions and the preparatory processes of the works of art and productions and festivals. This is unusual. 
it's not something that one, you know, that the public as well as the private is available to, for everyone to participate in. Not least the fun and private sites within the community at Ivy Lodge. The enterprise of the artist's camp or workshop was not a new one. Indeed, in India, the so-called, we used to call them camps in the old days, was one of the important reasons why the community of visual artists across the country remained a close-knit community, despite several argumentative differences of all kinds. The first of these camps was initiated at the behest of sculptor Shankhu Chaudhary at Gandharbal in Kashmir, and was then for several years run by the JNK state government. There were others later. The difference here was that it was initiated and developed hands-on by an infatigable artist who opened up his own private home. It grew to expand in many directions, which the ex exhibition explores. Evening pre-dinner discussions led to more formal seminars improvised satiry enactments to full-fledged theatric performances on stage, on stages made or even on their being brought down while they were being brought down, and film festivals that had cine historians bringing up archival footage in rattling Himachal transport buses. Among the several learning experiences in the three workshops I was part, at part of at Kasoli Arts Center, there was one pervasive affirmation of what at that time might have been an outdated, seemed an outdated aesthetic concept. The prevalent left modernism of the time would find little validity for the word atmosphere. Following Anuradha Kapoor, who co quoting Gurner Boom, finds function for the word as an important aesthetic category, validates for me personally an understanding which has been liberating, especially in the context of Kasoli. Thanks. Should I come up with Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction to Casoli. So let's begin with Casoli. I was going to start with an earlier body of work, but we'll get to that perhaps later. Uh, as Neelima already mentioned, there was already the idea of the artist camp, especially not in, uh, let's say, metropolitan center and traveling together and living together for shorter periods of time. But Casoli was special and it was entirely different from anything either before or I would argue even after. One, it was in a private home, a domestic home that one artist had opened up. Um, one of the things we don't speak about often enough is what all the artists, or many of them who were there. Um, Vivan wasn't present as an artist at the Kasoli Art Center. He was the organizer, the administrator, the provider of material, booking tickets, making travel arrangements, and this was part of his practice as an artist to create conditions for creative practice to flourish in that sense. Um, Nilema already spoke about atmosphere and what then are these conditions which allow for this, uh, for others to produce what they did. And I wanted to ask you Nilema because for me one of the striking things about the Kasoli Art Center which I haven't seen anywhere else um, at a place which is serious about work, it's not a retreat, is that families were welcome. Um, those of you who've seen the exhibition, and I hope will do tomorrow, you'll see a lot of photographs of a lot of children. Um, children who were there right from the age of six and repeated visits with their artist parents. Um, and they were sort of integrated into the activities out there. Um, you know, whether it was the seminars or the visual arts workshops or theater, um, as the case may be. And I wonder if this wasn't the case, as today contemporary art practice particularly sort of divides uh, or creates this divide between what is considered personal life and professional life. 
how might it have been different for, for instance, you uh, and Kabir and Samira were there, or Nalani Malani or Arpeta Singh or Madhvi Parekh? How might this have been different if families weren't as welcome as they were? I think that was a very important factor that, you know, how could so many women artists in particular, I mean, I'm, I, should, I would say, should say the, that the men as well, but we know that it was mainly the women, could have been away for so long, away from their ho studio uh, homes, and be working in a situation which was so far away. And, you know, it was just wonderful that because it was a house, it had the uh, ambience of a home, it could allow the children to feel uh, free. There were children of other artists there to, you know, to have a, their own sense of community with. And I think that for them to also be there to watch all this happening and growing up, I know that for my children, particularly for my daughter who was with me once when she was very young, uh, about seven, eight years old, and another time when she was a college student, it became a formative experience. So it was not just about that being there. Now, this was perhaps a, um, a, an un, understated, understated um, contribution by Vivan in particular, by, but the whole system for allowing this notion of feminism, another kind of a very practical, very real kind of way of coming into being. Yeah. That's something we'll get to also particularly um, uh, with an event, a seminar, and a theater or performance-making experiment in 1989. But sticking with the idea of feminism and its absolute uh, centrality in your work, if we could go back to actually a quite early series of yours, When Champa Grew Up, and it's a series of 12 paintings. Um, uh, these are just um, a selection from those 12. If you could tell us a little bit about this, and then we'll move forward into how it develops. Uh, but if you could just tell us a little bit about this series and what uh, drew you to the subject. Um, at the time, there was already quite a lot of uh, um, ferment amongst feminist circles in metropoli metropolitan cities like Delhi and Bombay, perhaps even Chennai. Uh, about this phenomenon that it came to be known as dowry deaths. And there, were a, uh, there was an agitation of beginning, there was a press was being able to talk about these things. But in a place like Gujarat, this was still not talked about very much. So for me, when something like this, when a girl was burnt alive, a girl I knew, whom my children had played with, was burnt alive by her newly, f newly made in-laws, was like, for me, it was fairly unbelievable. It took me about a year to internalize the way that I could think of, it, 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 it immediately was that I must talk about this in my work. But it took me quite a long time to think about how to talk about it, how to not put it flat out there so that it loses its uh, uh, its uh, its. I mean, there was a fragility in the notion that I didn't want to disturb. So the notion of making a, a series of paintings, more or less like a putter or a book to be read, one, uh, one image after another came into my mind. And I actually introduced some text into it, which uh, we were just talking about that, which were uh, songs that Gujarati women would sing 
about similar things, about brides being burnt. So it was a shock for me to, when my husband who helped me to locate these poems, to find that these were actually, there's a tradition of this. So it was a bo I mean, uh, at one level it was, my work became an illustration for it. So it also brought me to this idea of illustration, but in, it just seemed like such a cool way of being brought to that notion. Um, you're using the word illustration, but to think about the narrative then, uh, in terms of storytelling. Um, you've al already mentioned the patta, uh, the idea of a scroll, uh, which sort of unfolds across time and incident to incident, which you're incorporating in the series. Um, but you also trained uh, as a painter at Baroda. And from at least the early to mid 70s, there was a massive turn towards the figurative, but also the narrative. But also this idea that art isn't separate from life or from society. And if you were going to paint, it was about particular people in particular places as it uh, then came to be known. So could you tell us a little bit about precisely this sort of turn towards the figurative and narrative, but also, for instance, uh, and we see that in the Champa series, um, is we can see that a lot of what you're painting is rooted in a study of uh, historical art, for instance. So if you could talk about both of these, bringing together, let's say, historical forms. Let me see how I can... Uh, um, the, this what was came to be known uh, outside Baroda particularly as the narrative movement mm. was probably during the late 60s, early 70s, early 70s, mid, mid 70s. And uh, there, it was, uh, uh, there was also a sort of uh, thinking of a group of people outside Baroda who were, um, Baroda was a hub in those days, and a lot of people used to come to Baroda. So it, those ideas developed in Baroda, but they were possible to develop in Baroda because already there was a notion that uh, it's important for an artist to keep uh, their feet on the ground and to connect with their, the world around them. And uh, so this movement then developed. Now it was for me also a time when then I had my children and I was, they were growing up and I was, well, for like for all early mothers, it was a new experience. So I realized in some ways that my life, my space on the earth was a little different. And it was necessary to find my own voice. So, uh, I think I should, uh, I mean, I had um, in the presence of teachers like K.J. Subramaniam and then Gulam, who was, uh, whom I was married to, uh, who were deeply interested in other narrative traditions of art. So I had the privilege of being uh, grown up and educated in that uh, f environment. But for me then it became like finding my, in my environment and in the kind of play space of my children, my workspace. So I think that that is somewhat that I had to my neighborhood came to me that way. But then my neighborhood also had things like Champa. So. Um, one of the things that Neelima did today was visit the galleries here at this museum to look at the works specifically of a Pahari painter family, mm -hmm. but of Manaku, which in fact Professor B.N. Goswami was instrumental in bringing to light a family as the basis of style. And again, when we look at this work, and I want to again dwell on your relationship with art history or historical art, you were trained as a historian as well at Delhi University, um, is how were you working formally to make this bridge 
uh, and a conceptual bridge between what you were looking at and bringing, let's say, the symbolism of historical art or also, of course, from poetry, folk tales, and the rest of it into the work that you were doing that was addressing contemporary concerns, your life around. Yeah, like I said, that my neighborhood became learning, learning ground for me. I was reading uh, my neighborhood through the language of uh, discovering at the same time what was there in the Persian miniature or in the Pahadi miniature or in the Rajasthani miniature. Also looking at other ways of uh, unfolding of spaces like the Chinese scroll or the Japanese screen, you know, these were coming available to me. Uh, I was lucky to be in a time when the world was, had opened up and we had access to um, kind of looking at work of all, the, of all kinds of things. But then there was another factor, you know, in those days, People painted mainly on canvas, yeah. and uh, people painted, you You learned watercolor, and you learned uh, drawing and everything, but eventually you had to do oil painting. So by that time, since I had already become interested in looking at paintings which were done in other mediums, you know, so it became sort of logical for me to be also to try to learn these other, something about these other mediums. Unlike, the uh, tradition of contemporary young artists in Pakistan learning yeah. Mughal technique and, uh, in, and learning that and learning from that. I didn't have that formal training, none of us did. But I was also by that time interested in learning from the technology of that, not really from the yeah. technique. And I'd make a difference over here. Yeah. And that I wanted to knit that technology into the way that I was making my paintings about contemporary life. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so moving from a smaller scale, um, I want to actually jump right back into Kasoli um, and the international workshop of 1983. Uh, it was an international exchange that Vivan had uh, sort of affected. Uh, a group of you traveled to Italy and Germany. There was an exhibition of your work there. Um, and I'm just going to go through some of the images before we come back to Casoli. So for instance, um, this is the artist um, in Italy. Uh, and of course, then a group of German artists traveled to Casoli, not just to Casoli, they went to Baroda, uh, sites of historical art such as Ajanta and Elora. Um, and all of you spent uh, a few weeks together at Ivy Lodge. Um, and I wanted to ask you what that experience was for you, both traveling uh, through Italy and Germany and then to be working together with this group of German artists uh, in Casoli. Well, for me, it was uh, remarkable in many kinds of ways. Firstly, it was the first time that as an adult I had traveled out of the country but most of all, it was that in some ways, uh, you know, having studied in Baroda, we were taught a very, very um, methodical art history. And we learned art history through pictures. And then suddenly to be able to go and see them in the real, I mean, that was completely uh, another kind of experience and with, and to see them with people who cared about them in the same way as you did, you know, with other, other many, or it just happened that besides Arved Gorela, who was one of the, many of the other German artists were as interested in it, looking at, it, at Italian painting as, say, I was. And the other thing they were so surprised about is that there were other German artists, that they were so, they couldn't understand how we knew all these artists. <laughs> it was because of the course that we had gone through, you know, and uh, because for them, they were only being in the kind of, it was still not postmodern, modernism, postmodern, they yet hadn't come back to begin to look at their own uh, pre, um, 
pre-Renaissance art in any great, uh, with any great attention. So, so it was from them also, it was a discovery and for, so, so that one, that was wonderful sharing. Absolutely wonderful. Um, but also, uh, and that film is um, at the exhibition as well called Summer Guest that Navina Sundaram made uh, for German broadcast uh, television. Is um, also this encounter precisely what you just said that it, almost, and I'm putting this brashly, sort of a realization that uh, Europe is provincial or parochial in a way. Uh, the inability to know world beyond itself as such as well. Um, but again, to um, you've spoken also um, at other occasions about what it meant to be in a place with as much intensity as Kasoli, uh, where you would be working, but there would be seminars as well, and a lot of the international artists were showing work. Of course, arguments in the most productive sense of uh, the absolutely, word. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. And it was these uh, uh, pre-dinner and post-dinner discussions that actually helped one um, express oneself, learn from others, and more than anything else, you know, by our, by, um, by be, putting one in a sense, position of opposition, as one does in an argument, be able to validate one's own uh, convictions also. So both ways, it was like, uh, and, I knew uh, it helped me find out what uh, it was. It's interesting because, you know, people from the outside would often think that, aha, uh, Kasoli is all about one kind of artist and they all have the same kind of uh, political positions, the same kind of ideas. That was not so. That was not so. We had very different opinions and there was uh, sometimes maybe not easy space for all those opinions, but there was an argumentative space. And that is what was very valuable. And I remember, say, for instance, uh, 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 sitting at one level, there was Sudhir Patavadhan, Vivan uh, Sundaram, Gita Kapoor, and I at the other end, you know, having to withstand this kind of... Uh, <laughs> and so it really helped me strengthen my own convictions, besides being influenced. Uh, and again, then taking off from that point of uh, something that challenged you, again, something that you've uh, mentioned, and I should at this point actually mention a major publication that uh, a publishing imprint, uh, SSAF Tulika Books, uh, has produced uh, just this year on the Kasoli Art Center. Um, and it's got first-person narratives um, by many of the artists there as well, including Nilima. And I want to then talk about 1989 uh, and a major seminar that was convened, along with a sort of theater-making experiment um, at the same time. Um, and that's an image from there, uh, where you had Gitanjali Shri uh, doing the script, uh, Vidya Rao singing Tumri, Dadi Padamji working on puppets, Nivedita Menon, Radha Kumar, Kumkum Sangari, Tanika Sarkar, and all of them together in what I can only imagine would have been hugely explosive um, as a time. But the central question in both the sort of theoretical uh, discussions and what was then being produced in the evenings, in script, in music, in painting, was the question of figuring the feminine and what this could mean, if at all. Um, if you could just talk a little bit about that as well, Nilma. And you were, of course, present there, uh, I should mention at this point, uh, as somebody who was making the sets, designing the backdrops, and we'll speak a little bit about that formally, what that meant for your work, but second. Well, if there was uh, perhaps any one very specific uh, occasion where I, uh, which was like, what they used the word game changer for me, it was that workshop, for many reasons. Uh, it was started off firstly with a conversation with um, uh, the, uh, academics and activists and feminists 
uh, whom I get, got to know in Delhi. And I got to know them, and I got to know what was being planned in uh, Kusoli. And for the first time, I felt that a kind of uh, growth of my own ideas, as well as a sense of bonding that I had not been able to feel to learn, because living in a town like Baroda was different. And so this was, it, it was very f a fundamental change in the way that I began to think of my work and uh, think not just of my work, but of the world around me. But there was another, uh, another, there were several other ways, and one was that uh, I'd always been interested in, in uh, theater, but from the outside, now to be there in the theater and to understand that creation here has quite another meaning for me, which again like became for me, the whole collaborative nature of theater making was something that I had not experienced. I would not have been able to experience without being part of the theater. To have uh, some, you put to paint something and to have it um, remade by the performer in front of it was a marvelous experience. To for the actor, perhaps the fear of having the painted backdrop coming in the way of their thing. So I think it was this kind of additive process that you creation, creation is not, can need not be only about framing something, but it can be about adding things on and developing uh, something. So that for me, I was only coming to those ideas and then of course the next thing is scale. What theater could do, nothing else, um, had done for me so far. So I was always interested in working on a large scale and this gave me an opportunity that nothing else would have. But then working in Kasoli with scale <laughs> was a very, it was a very, uh, <laughs> it put, kept me right uh, to the size that I, uh, could be in that vast open area. One day I'll do something that I feel I can place in Kasoli, but that's some way off. Um, so in fact, the photograph that you see out here uh, are the two, were the two uh, performance spaces at the Kasoli Art Center. So the sunken area called the pit, and you see one of Nilima's um, backdrops in process, and that was the slab where the rehearsals and the performances would happen. And the idea of scale that Nilima is referring to is really a drop behind that railing out there. And on a clear day, you see Chandigarh and Ambala uh, and the lights uh, out there in the valley. So to produce a set or a backdrop, that is the scale that you were working in, uh, to be imagining that. Um, You've also elsewhere written and spoken about um, the collaborations that emerge from this. If you could tell us a little bit about Vivadi, because you continued then with uh, working with the theater um, and making sets and the idea of three dimensionality then in your work. And of course, this is a set that you designed for Umrao. Yeah, the this is designing for theater whether it was painting or just designing, was, uh, uh, took me to, like I said before, to the root of collaborating, that you, nothing you do is yours. And I think that that was uh, very, very uh, important. I mean, the whole notion of uh, being able to invent something changed with that because everything you were doing was an interactive, is an interacting position. I like then to take that into my other ways of practicing also, 
I tried to work with uh, people whom we call cra craftsmen, but craft, craft artists, maybe one should say, and to create a, a collaborative mural with them. I also work with a stencil maker very often, so I like to imagine and kid myself into thinking that's some kind of collaboration as well, because I'm using their worldview and bringing into mine. I know it's a slightly lopsided uh, uh, collaboration, but nonetheless, it is only through this connection with Vivadi and theatre making that these things opened up for me, and I think became important. And from that, I'm actually going to go now uh, into uh, a subject that has been a major focus of your work through the years, and that is Kashmir. Um, and you approach it through many ways. Um, one, of course, the poetry of Aga Shahid Ali. Um, you've had exhibitions, Country Without a Post Office, Each Night Put Kashmir in Your Dreams. Um, and this, of course, is Your History Gets in the Way of My Memory, one of the lines from his poem in 2003. And again, um, and I'll just go over a few slides. If you could talk a little bit about the various, again, you've talked about technology and the idea of stencil making or working with Vasli paper or paper, Sanganer, the stencils, but the idea of the Pichwai as well. There are different technologies of art making from different regions, et cetera, that you're working with, but also your um, sort of working with text and poetry and across, across the century. So you have Lal Dead's poetry, you have folk tales, um, but particularly with Kashmir, if you could talk a little bit about that and going back also to your travels there as a child, because you did travel extensively. I think that the realization that uh, uh, text does not take away from the poetry uh, um, after an upbringing in a more modernist kind of uh, frame um, came with partly with reading about Abhinandranath Tagore and his uh, then and to begin to understand that many of his works were illustrations and that illustration was not a bad word for them. That everything, uh, I mean, uh, we were so used to when we were art students to say, are wo to illustrative hai, matlab something, there's something missing or wrong with it. But I came to understand that uh, many of the, the artworks that I like best in the world are in some ways illustrations or have some basis in text, whether it's the life of Krishna, the life of Buddha, the life of Christ, so or many others. You know, and this is only th th there is a, such an integral connection often with the written word, the spoken word, performed word. So I think that. Uh, I was relieved to get over that uh, guilt about. And I took on the idea of doing a whole exhibition uh, based on, uh, I use the word illustrating particularly, illustrating the poetry of Akha Shahid Ali, who's, who in some ways had led me by the hand into trying to understand the present and past of Kashmir. And um, I had to learn my way because I was not trained as an illustrator. I couldn't take a subject and illustrate it. I had to find parallel ways in which I could crisscross with the text, back and forth, sometimes carrying one idea of one, one poem into the other painting. So maybe I was, uh, one could say I was not literally illustrating, but I think that that was for me um, learning how to, uh, finding a way of doing my own illustration. And again, we see, um, I had these images up, uh, Neelima, while you were speaking, again, the scale, but also working in a spatial way, where the viewer doesn't just look, you move um, in between the paintings, and the front has, of course, these, 
and the verso had a lot of text, um, again, stenciled um, onto the surface and the painting itself. Um, I also had a few images uh, from this quite remarkable uh, project of archiving uh, your documents that the Asia Art Archive did. Um, and if you could tell us a little bit about that, this you said was in fact work, a work made by the Bichwai painters. And you have this huge archive, and of course also working with pigments in different ways. So I'm just going to uh, show a few images of the sort of things that Nilema works with, uh, uh, both as motive, technology as well, like you mentioned, um, but also just the geographical range. Um, so I also know that you're deeply interested in, for instance, Tibetan Buddhist imagery whether it's the technology of tankha painting with brocade borders, or um, even the iconography that comes from different traditions of painting, let's say. So just to give you a sense of also uh, the range of those uh, motifs. And again, then tracing for stencils, clouds and fire, and tracing for stencils, different characters that find your way into paintings, and sometimes the same character uh, repeats itself in many ways. But I also then, um, this series from 2011, Rosegar, uh, which looks at craftspeople, but labor and the laboring body through the repetitive actions of making. And if you could tell us a little bit about that as well. Uh, well, using the stencil or using, uh, uh, repeating, uh, even text, is uh, trying to um, make that into a palimpsest in some ways. That it should discover a new meaning in a new context. An added meaning, I would say. Perhaps it's also that uh, um, Sort of lost a little bit of the. We went through a, a big Hanau. Well, so ma ma making stencils, I started with making, cutting my own crude stencils. Then I met this person who was uh, a Mathura grass person who would uh, uh, made this. He came from this family which made beautiful, beautifully crafted. Uh, stencils which was used for the decoration in Mathura for or uh, areas of Vaishnava, uh, Krishna worship uh, to embellish the temples. Now, in the, I was lucky in the Grass Museum, I came across this family and with them I struck a relationship and they began to uh, yield to my kind of uh, interests and even invite me to offer suggestions rather than just selling me things. So I got involved in that. I never would draw for them because that would be false. That would be interfering in their uh, language. But I did do things like bring, uh, when I went to China, I would brought some paper cuts from there and I showed it to them and got them to react. Or I would get, like, say, for instance, some of the things over here. Or uh, they or when went to Agra and photographed some of the jallies there and then asked, you know, introduced that to them. And it's interesting, he had his preferences. He quite liked the Chinese things. Anything that I, was slightly, what he'd say, he's a tribal. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so he was a Sharma in that sense. But he, uh, some, I mean, so that's what I mean, that it, in some ways it was gratifying because there was some collaborative. He was also l developing his likes and dislikes and hopefully they will enter his language at some stage or the other. Interestingly, I believe he has made a, a, a large mural. I mean, they don't traditionally use these as objects and they use them as stencils, not as objects. But sometimes for interior decorative purposes, they use the objects itself. And somewhere he has used things that I have, uh, which I'm totally delighted about. 
Um, and I just wanted to go over um, towards the end now. Uh, some of more, your more recent work, which continues this idea of making really an object that breaks away from what we think of conventionally as painting. And here I want to quote something uh, which you've said often. Um, and I'm quoting Neelam out here. I think I'm an artist because I am a painter and not a painter because I'm an artist. And I think that is something that you're quite clear in specifying. You refer to yourself as a painter, which otherwise one would think of as a medium. Um, and if you could just speak about that, because this, that's Nilima in a work at Documenta, belies a sort of conventional or conservative idea of what it means to be a painter as well. Well, how should I put it? Perhaps, uh, perhaps when I'm a little older than I am, and I'm not able to do all these uh, large works through which I can make performative or architectural spaces, I still like messing around on a piece of paper and, and doing, doing things. So I think that, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it, in some ways it is for me still painting that comes first. And really the last, uh, and again, uh, again a recent series for the Kochi Museris Biennale that you did, Salam Chechi. Um, again, coming full circle back to the figure of the woman, in this case, uh, Malayali nurses, caregivers, um, and also then, as with the craftspeople, uh, your focus on making the subject of your art those who are easily pushed to the margins or, let's say, oppressed castes um, as well. So you're continuing preoccupation in that sense as the subject, whether it's a region such as Kashmir, very, very complex, uh, but bringing these together. So if you'd like to just tell us about this series and what led to this. I think uh, most, of our, most of us who have got to a certain age or who have uh, seen their parents through a certain age understand what nurses do. But it's, it is acknowledged very rarely. And uh, I had these, I had parents who fortunately for me lived for many years. And uh, uh, so I had quite often to take them in and out of hospital. So I had home care nurses coming over. And uh, um, sometimes when my parents were recovering, I'd sit around drawing, drawing and I'd draw them. But more than that, I was each time I was doing them, I was saying to myself, Salam to the nurse. And one day I knew that I had to do a more um, substantial work. And because I was invited to the Kochi Biennal, which was in Kerala, I thought that is the right time to do it. But it's, going, it's an ongoing series, it'll go on. Um, and I just had this image with uh, two books, uh, one Sabdar Hashmi's Sare Mosamachi, um, and blue and other stories uh, that quite literally uh, Nilima illustrated with the paintings working alongside the text. Um, if we could open it up to questions in a moment, but I'd actually like to invite Neelam Man Singh uh, Chaudhary and Ranbir Kalika, both of whom were also an integral part of the Kasoli Art Center workshops, um, to just speak very briefly. Ranbir, you were there till the early 80s. Um, after which you left and went abroad. But if you could just speak a little bit about your time there and the work that you were making. And both of their work is in the exhibition as well, by the way. Um, so you should go see it. You know, as you said, I was there only in the initial, during the initial years. And then when some of the major things happened, uh, I was already away. I was not in India at the time. Uh, but I can speak a little about what uh, Kasoli did for me. Uh, after Chandigarh, I was in Patiala, and, and from Patiala I was invited over. So uh, the first thing was that the conversation around painting, as Nilima said as well, was very different from what I was familiar with. Uh, the, and also some, some new things came in which I wasn't aware of. For instance, art activism, I was not aware of it at all. And then uh, also the reading of a work of art. So uh, how do you read a work? How do you look at a work? I think that's all changed very much. I think that's 
uh, the major, one of the major contributions. And then there were other areas, I think uh, Nilima touched upon that as well, the, uh, like the pre-Renaissance work, the beauty of those. Uh, you know, that was, that got totally slipped by <laughs> in the Chandigarh Art College. Of course it would, you know, they, I'm sure they, many fine teachers came long later. Uh, but this was not one area that I was familiar with. And then uh, the, so and the connecting different art, art traditions and different art worlds, you know, like miniature painting and pre-Renaissance paintings and, the, and how one tells stories uh, differently, how they are narrative, both of them are narrative, but how they deal with time, for instance, and space. So th this was one of the contributions. Another great thing was the, uh, you know, different art forms like theater, cinema, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having met and spoken with theater people there and cinema people there and they became life, lifelong f uh, friends as well. And suddenly there was a loom there as well, then weaving, you know, and looking at it not only because I was just confined to oil painting, you know, after having done a bit of uh, everything <laughs> uh, in school at foundation level as one does. So looking at each of these as uh, a meaning-making activity, you know, uh, 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 that you are, uh, through that, you're reading yourself and you're reading the world as well through, through all these, and they uh, come together as in the world of art, and they are not separate from each other. I think that was another thing. And also the kind of, for instance, cinema, I was always interested in cinema, but the kind of fulfillment that the cinema which I saw there, uh, that changed a lot. It seemed that, oh, this is touching a space within me uh, that is very much I can be in kinship with. So I think that that was one other great, uh, again with theater, I never knew that such complex meanings could be said through theater. I had not seen theater of that kind before. And then friendships which were made, that continued. And even, for instance, when Ken Kiff was there, I wasn't there. But when I went to England, we formed a lifelong uh, you know, friendship until he died. And he used to write very beautifully. So I'll end with something beautiful which I got from Ken Kiff. You know, we used to write very often to each other. Uh, the way he spoke about a work of art. When he spoke about a work of art, if the work of art is here in the center, he will circle it, he will continue to circle it without touching the artwork in his words. But then he would get very close, but as he drew close, he would draw away again, further away. But, it, but it, there was some thread which remained connected. And so the, the meaning through this kind of reading became more complex. Uh, allowed other uh, parts to, to reading the same work. And I think this was one of the great gifts I got. Thank you. Um, the thing that Rati was referring to is, uh, and that's also what made Kasoli um, very different from any other sort of art camp, is that it wasn't just visual arts camp with just painting or just sculpture, uh, even though that was happening, is that there would always be a seminar. Every artist was also giving a lecture. Um, people were also invited, sociologists, um, Jeet Oberoi, J.P.S. Oberoi, or Jyotindra Jain to talk about craft traditions, K.G. Subramaniam talking, um, Bhupen Kakkar talking about a book he had read. All sorts of things. And this was a part of what was considered as essential to art practice per se. And then I'd like to turn to Neelam uh, Man Singh Chaudhary, who was also there um, uh, uh, at the Kasoli Art Center. The other thing that is not spoken about enough is the links that Vivan and the Kasoli Art Center were making with Punjab and Himachal. And Neelam, in fact, brought up a troupe for a performance of Nakal. So Neelam, if you could tell us about that as well, please. Uh, I really don't know how it started, my equation with the Kasoli Art Center. I had been living in Bhopal, working in Bharat Bhavan. I knew Vivan and Geeta when I was a student at the NST. But I just knew them because they were such a good-looking couple. And they were doing such phenomenal 
artwork and she was writing so well. So it was more like being awestruck as a student. And then being in Bharat Bhavan in Bhopal became, it was a multi-arts complex where everyone came. And all of them sort of, I took them shopping, gave them a meal, gave them a bed to sleep on. So s friendship started developing very uh, naturally, organically, silently, and it culminated in my being invited to the Kasoli Art Center when I was in Chandigarh. So we used to go there, but I don't think I was ever a participant in terms of the way Nilma or Ranveer were. I was more like somebody who enjoyed being there, listening, seeing films, which I would never had have had access to otherwise. And as it was very rightly said by Nilima, it was like a place where you came with your families. So you didn't say art was here and life was there. You didn't se separate your personal domestic space with your artistic yearnings. So it was a wonderful uh, collating of both these energies. And I remember my children running all over the place. And I remember when, and then also what happened is that uh, when everyone was driving back to Delhi, because I was situated in Chandigarh, it became the place where everyone stopped by for a cup of chai or for a hurriedly assembled meal or to visit the washroom. So relationships continued. And when the theater workshop, which is the question you asked me, was happening, um, I, I was searching for a way of working because most of us who went to drama schools were taught Western forms of training, you know, it was Stanislavski, it was Mayor Holt. So I think this whole uh, uh, debate of trying to find a training process that was local, vernacular, regional, was affecting a lot of us working in different uh, regions. You know, Ratan Thiam was doing it in Manipur, Panikar was doing it in Kerala. So I thought I'll do a similar experiment in Punjab. Of course, when I left Bharat Bhavan, I was teased that Punjab has no folk form. It only has Gitta and Bhangra. Forms that are very robust and very beautiful, but certainly not what I was searching for. Then I came across, after a whole series of trial and error, a group of Nakals. Nakal, Nakal is from the word Nakal. It's a Persian word, which means to imitate. So they were funsters, they were ad-libbers, they were um, um, commentators. Uh, but what really fascinated me about them was the dimension of the female impersonator, which is intrinsic to their training. So when, when I came to Kasoli, I was actually trying to explore my own history, language, image making, colloquialism, where I was coming from, my own context, in which my further work would ultimately got based upon. So uh, I, uh, I was invited by, by Vivan and Geeta to come and showcase the initial work I was doing with them, which was part of my research, really. And I remember it rained so heavily that I couldn't perform in the slab. But the next day, because we were all there, and the rains had stopped, so we performed in the driveway. So it was a very exciting experience for me. And because I was pining and missing Bhopal so much and Bharat Bhavan and all my pals there, so it became like a wonderful space to connect with, which was full of nostalgia for me, for what I'd left behind. And um, uh, as uh, Anuradha very nicely wrote in her um, chapter on the fall of the slab, that uh, Atmosphere is both physical and it's also intangible. So it was the intangible atmosphere of the, of the Kasoli Art Center, which I'd internalized, absorbed, and continued nurturing within myself. Thank you. <laughs>